Hey everyone, my name is Steve Abrams. I'm a backend engineer on the delivery team at GitLab. And today I thought I would take some time to go over at a high level um, about GitLab's deployments and releases. So we'll take a look, uh, or we'll start by taking a look in the handbook. And if we search for deployments, we'll find this deployments and releases page. So this goes over some general ideas of, of how these work at GitLab. And then there's lots of links if you want to dig in a bit further. But at a high level, um, we have deployments for GitLab.com, and then we have releases for self-managed users. Uh, and so there's two different product types here, essentially. We have GitLab.com, which is a SaaS offering where any users can come sign up, and they all work off of our, you know, the, the version of GitLab.com that we're running. Then we also publish uh, the, the GitLab software for um, self-managed use. So that means that someone can come and install GitLab on their own servers and run it themselves. So there's a difference in how we release this as well. So GitLab.com uses a model called continuous delivery. So continuous delivery means that changes are constantly getting pushed to production, which means that if you're a developer at GitLab, uh, when you have your changes merged, it will soon thereafter be included in a deployment that goes straight to production on GitLab.com. That also means that if you are a customer using GitLab.com or a user using GitLab.com versus a user using self-managed, the GitLab.com user will end up seeing features um, right away when they are deployed, whereas a self-managed user will have to wait for those to be published in a release. So we can take a look here at this diagram of kind of what that looks like. So when code is changed and merged into the default branch for the GitLab project, um, there comes a point in time at which that uh, code will be like cut, is what, I guess what we could call it. So we cut that code at a certain point and say, okay, everything before this uh, commit or before this merge request is going to be deployed to GitLab.com. Then we create a package that can be installed on our servers. And that's all handled by the distribution team. And then that package is then deployed through a deployment pipeline that makes its way through all of these different environments and QA testing to GitLab.com. And then that process repeats itself. So we actually do this several times per day. Uh, I think recently we've been averaging around six or seven times per day that we deploy to GitLab.com. Now, a release is a little bit different, but all a release is, is we say at some point, so on the 22nd is when we've been doing our releases every month, um, we say, okay, this package that we deployed uh, earlier today to GitLab.com is stable. It works correctly. Or there's no problems with it. Let's go ahead and tag that as version 16.2. And then that version is then published or tested a little bit more and then published um, as a package that self-managed users can consume. So deployments are just packages that are constantly getting um, installed and deployed to GitLab.com, whereas a release is just simply one of those packages we have chosen to call the next release. There are some special releases, which are going to be our patch and security releases. So anytime we have security changes or bugs that we really want to include for a self-managed user, um, we will then create a specific package that includes those changes. But in terms of what's happening on GitLab.com, they just get included in one of these continuously delivered packages. Um, now, if we dig into these deployments a little bit, there's a few links down here um, that get into it a bit more. Deployments page. So, What's happening several times a day, and it's actually this many times a day, or how many times we possibly could deploy to GitLab.com. It's not how many times we do deploy, it's just how many times we create that cut of here we will create a package and it may or may not be deployed at that time. Um, so there's different deployment strategies when we talk about 
how these packages go from being a package to being installed on being run in production. So GitLab uses a canary style strategy. There's other style strategies. Uh, you might've heard blue green thrown around as well, but the canary strategy follows the canary in the coal mine, uh, coal mine uh, idea, which is uh, canary was taken into the mines and uh, canary was more susceptible to carbon monoxide poisoning. And that would give miners an early warning to get out of the mine in case they're gases. So the same thing applies to how we deploy to production. So we have our production servers that are running gitlab.com, but then we have a small subset that we call canary. And so every time we get one of these new packages coming in every few hours with new changes, first we deploy it to the canary environment and we let it sit there for uh, however long and we run some QA checks on it and we let some traffic go to it. It's usually only around 5% of all traffic on gitlab.com that's, that's going to that canary environment. And we have monitoring in place so that if something goes wrong, we can quickly just move all of that traffic back to the main servers and um, they only briefly saw any problems and the vast majority of users saw no problems whatsoever. If everything looks good on canary, then we go ahead and roll out that change to all of production and then start the process all over again. If you're curious whether or not you are um, using Canary, you can check that by looking at next.gitlab.com. So right now I am not using Canary. I'm on the current version. If I want to be using Canary, I can just toggle this button here and I will be using the Canary infrastructure. Another way you can do that is if we go to, for example, I think we can do this from the group page, if I recall correctly. Um, so if I just go to this page, um, and then on my keyboard, I type in PB, then that brings up this nice little um, tool up here that has lots of different information about what's going on, but we can also see up here that I am currently on a canary. Um, server. Whereas if I turn off Canary and then reload the page, I will see that I'm no longer on Canary. So when it comes to deployments, the main thing that I think uh, engineers see a lot or pay attention to a lot is they want to know where it is in the process after it gets merged. So your merge request gets merged and you want to know how far along is it in the, in the process of being deployed. So I think a lot of people are used to either looking at the impacted environments to see where it's deployed to, or probably more often this workflow label that gets automatically applied after merge. And we can see it go through staging canary and canary staging and then production. And then we have a few other workflows for um, certain types of database migrations. So in another video, I will dig into how you can really understand um, more about what these deployments look like. But for now, I think this gives an overview of what our deployment structure looks like, how to follow your um, changes through to production, and um, a little bit about uh, what the delivery team works on. So the delivery team uh, specifically is responsible for the deployment process and tooling, as well as the release tooling. Um, and you'll often hear the term release managers. And so Every month, there are a few members of the delivery team that are assigned as release managers, and they are in charge of making sure that the releases happen on time and that any sort of coordination that needs to happen between delivery and other groups like development, infrastructure, AppSec, quality, all of those things are you know, uh, continuing to happen and move the deployment process and the release process along. Um, that's it for this video. So. Hopefully uh, that answers a lot of questions and 